I'm very pleased to be here and to talk about the triple helix. Uh, I spoke about the triple helix in my interview in um, end of last year and I just joined St. Mary's in January and I remember that uh, I was asked what is this and I realized that being in a Catholic institution the metaphor of the triple helix resonate very closely with the uh, Holy Trinity and uh, what you may find from my presentation is that actually the metaphor still represents uh, something which we don't quite understand what it is so uh, uh, I hope that with my presentation I will give you a little bit insight into what is this the triple helix and how we can benefit from research in the field of triple helix now these are the academic origins these are the uh, science and technology policy research uh, uh, a field which uh, uh, always has been interested in the government what the government does in terms of policies, policy instruments, and then the uh, universities being subject to governance. The, uh, the first conference, Triple Helix Conference, took place in 96, so the community of Triple Helix scholars has over 20 years um, experience, and we celebrated our 20 years uh, with our annual conference in Heidelberg, uh, um, to which I was chair of the scientific committee. Uh, now, what is the triple helix? It's the government, the academia, and the industry. And often the academia is understood only as a tertiary sector. However, everybody knows that academia is the knowledge institutions and much of the writing and the models, the triple helix models, uh, sometimes they talk about universities but they really think about the knowledge institution, any institution which contributes to knowledge creation and knowledge dissemination. And what the initial thinking was is that what is the role of government? Subsidies for innovation, paying the universities huge grants to do their research, to do their teaching, the primary mission of the universities to, deal, to do teaching, the secondary mission to do research, and now uh, within the literature we're talking about the third mission of the universities to go out outreach activities and to do something for the community or to to have an impact on the policy process the first uh, static model is that the government is using monetary policies some other instruments orchestrating behavior behavior of industries and behavior of universities now what apparently came about is, and it is acknowledged as the second model or less a fair triple helix model, that first the government wanted to release this control. And uh, they, uh, to some extent, decided, okay, we have to find financial instruments or other policy instruments not to keep everything under control, but to let the universities develop. And I think from UK perspective, our universities have always been autonomous. We have no problem with that. But the, the rest of Europe had real problem with that because their university systems in many countries uh, were totally dependent on local governments, local authorities, central authority. So uh, this laissez-faire triple helix model basically acknowledges that the innovation system has three big components and these components need to be made to work together. We have private sector innovation, we have public sector innovation, academies of sciences in addition to the university sector. So we have a complex stage, innovation stage, and the triple helix became the governance model behind innovation systems. Now, uh, the next stage, third stage, which is mode two and mode three. Now the, this is a model, theoretical model, which says that these this uh, this engaged actors and players, actually they have to start to coordinate 
activities and to collaborate in policy settings, in strategic uh, decisions. And uh, it is not s so much what the state does and what the academia does and what the industry does in terms of innovation, but it is what they do together. And in this model, we have institutional spheres. This is the, ah, I didn't know this is a touch screen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, sorry. So these spheres operate independently. What HEFKI does, they do by themselves, but they engaged in consultation. What academia does, we do by ourselves, we are autonomous entities, but we actually try to interact with the state, we try to interact with industry, and very often this interaction between industry and academia has lots of tensions, because we speak different languages. They have much shorter time horizon to commercialization, we just wander around wonderful ideas. And uh, there is a lot of friction in these spaces of overlap. But this is where we see the effectiveness of the triple helix. Uh, and this is where we see economies of, uh, or uh, where we have coordination uh, engagement where we have more efficiencies emerging. Now there is another magic triangle here which is called the positive overlap. A multi-stakeholder engagement where all these three parties sit together around the table and they make decisions. And even though this looks like a dream world, actually it does happen in some regions in Europe, the so-called entrepreneurial discovery process, when regional authorities brought their knowledge providers, those that have got some European research funds, they brought some key stakeholders from the industry and they sat together and decided on smart specialization strategies, where are their competencies, what is their competence base and how to organize the investment process around this competence base, including the universities have actually to introduce new programs that are in demand by the private sector. So we have some positive interaction here. Uh, we have many uh, interesting examples, for example in Russia they require all programs, degree programs, to have uh, on the validation panel representative from the industry. And uh, the, uh, th uh, the input from industry is critical in terms of who needs this uh, degree. Now, uh, what you see here is these interactions are very complex, very complicated, and uh, they um, hold a lot of tensions. Now, Triple Helix uh, has been embedded in a lot of policy thinking. This is the World Bank Index for the Knowledge Economy. And what you see here, very clear vision of the role of the state, very clear vision of the role of the knowledge institutions, and uh, unfortunately, what they see in terms of contribution to the knowledge economy from the private sector is to build the infrastructure to develop our internet. And somehow, if we have the internet, magically, we can build the knowledge economy. However, there was something very important here, which emerged at very early stage, in the late 90s, called innovation systems. And uh, the vision of what an innovation system should contain has evolved quite nicely. Uh, and this is the Global Innovation Index, I don't know whether you are familiar with it. Anybody heard of the Global Innovation Index? Yes? No? Okay. Now, it's a wonderful um, catalogue of performance, innovation performance, and this is their matrix, how they actually measure innovation performance, and uh, this is the innovation output, by the public, the private sector. This is the innovation, uh, sorry, input and output, what comes out, our publications, patents, citations, and uh, including online creativity, which means how many videos we upload on YouTube. If we upload these videos, UK will score higher. 
So I think we need a commitment from all of us to generate content, knowledge content. We want UK to score higher, don't we? <laughs> okay, so what we see here is the concept of innovation system which has input and output. And the question of efficiencies, now we have innovation efficiency ratio a, a calculation which gives a country a very uh, a particular score. And based on their performance, the countries go up and down the innovation index. Uh, now, this is another instrument to measure innovation performance, which is developed by the European um, Union. And this is called Innovation Union Scoreboard. And the indicators are based, are defined similar but different. And again, we have a very clear view of that there is a role of the state, there is a, a role of knowledge institutions. However, what we have here is very clear distinction what the private sector should do. And not very clear distinction between the knowledge institutions and the state. What the state should do. So somehow the role of the state became blurred. What is the state responsibility? And I, uh, in one of my last slides I will comment on that. Everybody expects the um, uh, state just to pay for our innovation and creativity. Now, uh, the interesting thing about the triple helix is that it needs something to drive these interactions. It, re it needs driving forces. And there is a question, who drives the triple helix? Is it the state through financial instruments? Is it the uh, university through a particular um, community action? Or is it the business with particular um, critical innovation, key enabling technologies? And uh, this question hasn't been answered, what these different helices should do to optimize the communication and the conversation. And um, um, what is critical here is that the drivers of the tri triple helix are still individuals. So it's not the institutional spheres by themselves, what the state does or state institutions such as HEFKI or UKRC or institutions like that, but it is individuals that circle through spheres and circle across spheres. So the magic of the triple helix is in the hands of few people that actually can make sense of these complex relationships. Uh, two very quick definitions of innovation, very complex. Uh, what we know is that uh, innovation is magic. It's purposeful, but it requires open mindset. And uh, when we create bordery, uh, borders and boundaries, these are all barriers to innovation. This is another very complex uh, diagram just very briefly, that the innovation process is entangled in market process, particularly uh, which drives the private sector, and in political process. And what we see, all of this political process behind our uh, REF, which uh, uh, is critical for the functioning, for the short-term and long-term horizon of the university sector. Now, uh, the final two, three slides. Where does this lead us, the triple helix model? The old model, how we support innovation, uh, the old model uh, suggested that you should invest. These are the factors of production, whether the public sector or the private sector, if you put these factors of production, somehow innovation will spur. Uh, the new model says that even if you put more money, you don't necessarily get more innovation out of the system. So you should create enablers to drive this innovation. And what the 
final model is talking about is <coughs> leadership. So uh, free flow of information, uh, open boundaries, uh, global platform outreach, cross-border mobility of researchers, people traveling across border. So anything which puts boundaries will have a negative impact on innovation. And I will finish with the final slide, which uh, is basically there are critics of triple helix model. And uh, uh, this is uh, coming from one of my favorite institutional economists, my Mark Kasson, for those that know him. He, he honestly tried to believe in the triple helix, but he raised some very important questions. So why do we need three-way collaboration? Is it more cost effective? Or basically we need to make sure that each of these actors do what they are supposed to do. And what exactly is the role of government in, uh, uh, from economic policy perspectives? Are we talking about subsidies to higher education or intermediation in these triple helix engagements, RCUK, or some subsidized intermediation and what this may look like? And what are the unintended impacts of the triple helix? And he raised an issue that there are many unintended impacts of the current engagement of the state with the functioning of the universities, prioritizing applied science, which puts pressure on uh, um, basic science, and uh, this kind of distortions which we see in the university sector being direct impact of inappropriate state intervention. So the critics of the triple helix are there, but this raised the question is how can we do more research on this topic? Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know how much I managed to bring this back to um, ground level understanding, but uh, I hope you get uh, my passion about the triple helix.